My name is Dr. Talitha Washington. I am the director of the Data Science Initiative. So welcome today to the Student Data Science Symposium. We're in it for a real treat here today for the keynote, not because her last name is Washington, but be, maybe it's because her first name is Gloria. So Dr. Gloria Washington, who's an associate professor at Howard University in computer science, is going to talk to us today. And at Howard, she runs the Effective Biometrics Lab, and her research includes effective computing, computer science education, biometrics, data science, AI, all, all that good stuff. She's leading research that explores the role of affect, emotion, and imposter syndrome on performance in computing courses. She's also looking at exploring the link between technology, mental health, and Black women's hair texture. So she really has some interesting segues in how her research is uncovering and, and looking at different topics. Today, her remarks are gonna focus on how to use data science to reduce racist, sexist, and hate speech, which I, I think is more than timely uh, given how our current landscape and, and things that could go in a better direction. And she's gonna show us how to do this using data. So if you have any questions that you want to put in the chat, you can put either there in a QA and a or the chat, because so, after she presents, we're going to do an interactive Q&A. So as you're thinking, you can type some questions or comments. I see you, Chris, H-U, you know. Good to have you in the house, in the A, as they say. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gloria Washington. Thank you so much for having me here today. I am so excited to give you this presentation. And um, I'll start. Okay. So uh, today I am going to talk with you about using data science to reduce racist, sexist, and hate speech. And um, a little bit about me before I start, Gloria Washington, Howard University. Um, I'm an associate professor now, yay me, in computer science. I graduated from a smaller HBCU in Missouri, uh, Lincoln University in Missouri, 1866. So, uh, and then I uh, moved to the Washington DC area and went to George Washington. So um, my areas of expertise are human-centered computing, but uh, personally, uh, what I like to say about myself is that I want to increase the number of Black women that get PhDs in computer science. And so um, at Howard, like we've been focusing on um, really doing that. And so I also love undergraduate research and is that a crime? And so within the Washington, Yes. I'm sorry to do this, but I, I did warn you. We, we have a, um, a presenter in the house. I, uh, Dr. French is here and wanted to say hello. I, I don't see him on the live platform, but I'm wondering if he could put his comments in the chat. I think he has joined as an attendee and not coming through the stage. But Dr. French, go ahead and put a hello there in the uh, chat. And we're so good to have you here today joining us with uh, Double Dr. Washington's. So go, go ahead, uh, Gloria, take it away. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Okay, going back there, okay. And so in the Effective Biometrics Lab, me and my students, what we work on is truly trying to like marry um, behavioral information with like physiological and or physical characteristics so we can ask these sort of questions. Who is that? Uh, what are they feeling? And how are they going to react or behave? And what can we do as technologists to impact us in a positive way? And so um, today, what I'm going to talk with you about is kind of how this uh, idea of using data science and AI and ML kind of sprang and uh, caught my attention and also my students' attention because we're working on it all together. So the evolution of this work is that um, I work at Howard. I work with, um, I would say, many undergraduates, and I was teaching the introductory computer science classes, CS0, yeah, 1, 2, and so a lot of my students would come into the office and then get um, 
advice on how they can get through the technical interviews. And one of the things that the students would always say to me is that, well, you know, these technical interviews, it's not only just about like um, my technical skills, it seems like I always get these sort of things that the interviewer would say to me, well, you should know this, or they don't teach that at your HBCU, or even sort of microaggressions related with how tall they were. Um, there was a specific student that, that had said um, a specific interviewer said to them, we're comfortable in Silicon Valley, but not that comfortable. And I've, I've been to Silicon Valley myself, and we see individuals who wear shorts for interviews and who basically roll out of bed and come to work. So I was like, that was an interesting question because they always say come as you are. And it's really just about, you know, um, your ability to code, but obviously it's not. So therefore, for me, what I wanted to do was figure out, okay, put myself in um, the, the shoes of my students. So therefore, I went to Silicon Valley and uh, as part of the faculty and residence program that Google also has and other companies also have, we were like exposed to the technical interview itself. I actually did several of them and it's stressful. I forgot everything that I knew. And I'm like, I actually teach this class, I know nothing. But then they also showed us like some diversity, equity, and inclusion training that they give their actual interviewers. So I was wondering, like, they're trained all in um, you know, being able to respond positively to students to encourage them to come to different kinds of companies. But what still remains is that there's always this underlying microaggression either based on your race also based on your schooling, if it's the difference between almost a, a predominantly white institution and or a HBCU. Like um, if you didn't go to a Carnegie Mellon and you were um, still a black person who went even to a state school, there was just a lot of um, microaggressions that kind of underlie the surface. So what I wanted to do was, well, how can I, through my lab and the working with my students actually create something to um, begin to look at this so that individuals can then become more empathetic. And then actually, you know, DNI training that we usually undergo at companies or also in academia as well, like maybe we could get more bang for our buck in thinking of that. So um, in study of microaggressions, uh, this was new to me in that, um, of course, I knew high level what they were, but I was thinking to myself, well, OK, I need to partner with the psychologist at Howard who really has experience in this area. And so um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Deshaun Mann, sort of kind of gave me a crash course in microaggressions in the work that she is studying. So the definitions of microaggressions is that they're nonverbal, but sometimes verbal. They can also be gestures. They can be between individuals, groups, races, cultures, uh, and or genders. There's many, many different types, and they're very subjective. Um, what usually happens when a person is a victim to a microaggression, they may be insulted, and you may, and they may feel some kind of way. You know, but usually they don't say it. I will say like maybe my generation, we don't talk about that as much, but I will say younger generations, they'll just call it out. And so there's this thing called intersectionality where it's this framework of how a person's social and political identity is combined to create these different modes of discrimination. So take a person like me. Um, uh, who is a black woman working in tech. And so sometimes the, the microaggressions that I get on the right hand side are many. Um, you speak so well, you're so articulate, your hair is pretty. And then also from within cultures, I'll get, oh, you're pretty for a dark skinned woman. <laughs> People have said that. Or, um, oh, uh, you're so smart to have went to an HBCU. So because of my lived experiences, this intersectionality of the different microaggressions that um, assault me on a daily basis is like many. But I will say, uh, you just get used to hearing them. And I'm pretty sure that everyone on the line kind of gets used to hearing them. So for me, when I wanted to actually look at uh, this area, there's so many different things that people talk about with D and I, and I always wanted to be um, immersed in the technology only, but I had to know the, the definitions of D and I. And so for me, 
I was like, okay, well, diversity is this representation of a range of traits and experiences and inclusion is the degree to which employees feel valued, respected, and accepted. And then equity is promoting justice, impartiality, and fairness. And so within these companies, a lot of them um, believe that uh, they focus on these things. However, um, 76% of US employees and job seekers, they say they want this diverse workforce and that it's an important factor when evaluating companies and job offers. But when we get into the racial inequality in America that uh, these companies are spending close to 16 trillion, and this was from 2020. And so um, they're spending all of this money on diversity, equity, inclusion, but um, the numbers in Silicon Valley are low for black and brown um, software engineers. And so maybe it's just not working as, as um, much as we think that it is. So, well, I said, well, okay, how can I begin to look at this and then one day begin to help these companies and maybe they can spend some of this $16 trillion on students in my lab and then the work that we're working on. So we began to look at microaggressions and social media data. And so with part of that, um, there's a lot of research that has already been done on hate speech and online abuse of speech detection in 2017. And then um, there also was uh, microaggressions in social media data using support vector machines from Brett Feller in 2019. And so um, since then, um, several different researchers have started to look at, well, how does microaggressions um, play in other kinds of areas of computer research, like cybersecurity platforms? And so from there, I was thinking, well, hmm, we need to, as a lab and as Howard University, create a data set that looks beyond social media data because it looks like you know everyone thinks of Twitter social media data and a lot of the microaggressions that occur there but what about pop culture and so that is how I began to explore this area and creating this data set and or research area that I like to call ABL micro and so what is ABL micro Basically, the name just comes from Effective Biometrics Lab Microaggressions. So what we did was create a data set of more than 3,000 examples of microaggressions that were taken from television shows from the 80s, the 90s, and um, across different um, decades. So Golden Girls, I was raised on Golden Girls, and Golden Girls is still in... Um, you know, syndication. So these things are still being watched. The Office, All in the Family, um, many different ones. So what we did was uh, annotate these microaggressions that occurred from these shows, um, looked at the scripts and downloaded them. And then uh, from the video segments, we actually snipped the video and the audio and then um, we noted the race and the gender of the individuals in the scene and the contextual information was captured. So truly what we wanted to explore was, uh, at least in American culture, television shows uh, are embedded in almost everything and sort of, you know, art imitates life and life sometimes imitates art where we take these particular jokes and we um, use them in everyday life. And some of the situations I'm sure that a lot of people have been involved in in the office, you could, or if you've watched the office, you've kind of experienced um, those particular DNI people and or managers who just have no filter. Okay, so this is an example of three different uh, microaggression um, clips. Uh, and then a row from our data set. This is from All in the Family, season one, episode 13. So a lot of you students are were, weren't even thought about, actually, <laughs> when uh, this television show was on. But it's All in the Family. It aired from like 1978 to, I think, 1984 or something like that. But it was, it was, let's just say, a hotbed of racism, sexism, and all of this at the time was funny. So let's try and listen. It's just stupid there, Jefferson. Besides uh, getting elected, there's more to that than just being smart. There is, huh? 
then how come we don't have a black president? I mean, some of our black people are just as dumb as Nixon. <laughs> you ain't got a black president, Jefferson, because God ain't ready for that yet. That's right. God's got to try it out first by making a black pope, which he ain't done yet. <laughs> Whether a black man or a white man should be president? Well, what do you want to talk about, little guy? How about a woman president? Oh, holy cow. <laughs> okay. It's just stupid, Jefferson. <laughs> so, um, the three different clips that were put together here, there were many, many microaggressions and or jokes that were contained in this television show. And, um, for some of the younger people, if you have kind of caught a clip of the Jefferson, so this was the first iteration of what the Jefferson guy would look like. But anyway, so in this case, Archie, um, the first, he says, uh, that's just stupid, Jefferson, you know, the thing about the black president. So um, at the time, of course, when this aired, there wasn't even a thought of a black president and that was a negative thing. And then also he says that, um, well, Jefferson says that, you know, a black president can be just as stupid or whatever as anyone else. But so and then at the end of the clip, there also was a an example of a gender microaggression because she says there could be a woman president. And then he just says, ah. So if you think about how individuals like myself um, telling my age who were raised on this and we used to laugh at these individual kind of things, how then these sort of jokes either um, you know, permeated society and or script writers took it from their own sort of personal experiences. But we wanted to be able to use this information and provide it to researchers so that they would be able to use it in their research as well. So from there, um, we looked at, well, not only just like releasing this to the public, but then also using this for models. So we are creating machine learning models that will then eventually be able to identify the microaggressions that not only would occur in the text, occur in the speech, and then hopefully one day the um, gestures. Okay, so the inspiration um, for this is to also um, look at how some individuals believe, well, there isn't this field of microaggressions and that it just really doesn't exist. And then, so Lillian Field in 2017 said that it is certainly possible microaggressions can in some cases be harmful, but we need to study this phenomenon better to encourage difficult conversations. Um, he's no longer uh, alive. However, uh, this researcher, psychologist researcher, believed that because microaggressions were so subjective that anything could be a microaggression. So um, from there, we said, well, OK, uh, we have a model that's working currently using support vector machines and then also um, other machine learning algorithms. Can we utilize this in healthcare research to be able to help black and brown patients as they go to the doctor. And so if you know anything about healthcare, um, black and brown patients feel less, uh, there is this belief that black and brown patients feel less pain than their white patients and that um, racism and microaggressions are present in doctor's notes and then also the nurse's notes when um, individuals are talking to their doctors. And so AI has already been used to help doctors identify disease, but what we thought is this missing link between um, the, what the actual doctor is saying, and then also fostering empathy in these healthcare professionals, because a lot of times when they go through medical school, they don't really get any sort of training beyond the cultural competence training. And sometimes it is just a, a text, a, a checkbox. So that leads me to the next project. And this project 
um, will utilize the information that we got from the ABL to be able to identify the microaggressions, hopefully, in what a doctor and or nurse may enter into their diagnosis plans. And so the Visibility Project is a project that is um, co-led by myself and Dr. Hairston, and um, it talks about racism in psychiatry. And so the scenario that I'm going to go through is uh, you will have a doctor who is a psychiatrist. And in psychiatry, most psychiatrists in America are mainly older white men. And um, on the other hand, the individuals that are most likely diagnosed with schizophrenia and some of the other disorders that really can affect people's lives with their jobs and, and maintaining their home life are Black men. Black men are the number one individuals who are diagnosed with schizophrenia. And then oftentimes they are misdiagnosed. It, it truly is uh, relates to culture. So in the particular visibility project, what we do is sort of um, go through a day in the life of Malcolm. So this scenario that I'm going through is just something that Dr. Thompson would possibly say to a Malcolm. And is, uh, you people are always late. Why can't you just request the day off from your job on appointment days? And so Malcolm, who's the patient, I'm, I'm sorry I'm a little late for my appointment. My job doesn't offer PTO. I just want to get better please don't cancel this appointment. And a lot of times individuals that are diagnosed with schizophrenia actually are lower income and have trouble uh, getting to the appointments. And these appointments usually don't last a long time. So he wants to take his medication and just get better for his job and for his family. And so um, you're not following your diagnosis plan. I can't tell. I can tell you're not taking your meds. And of course, um, Malcolm withdraws and he just feels like no one is listening, listening to him or trying to help him. And basically, um, Dr. Thompson is noting this agitation and this withdrawal usually in the diagnosis plan that will accompany Malcolm for the rest of his um, medical journey and or life because electronic medical records stay with you forever. So once you have that diagnosis, you can't get past it. So um, in his head and also he's just saying, why won't people listen to me? I just want to, I just want help. And then there are cases where a Dr. Thompson will just say, I want to help this individual. Why isn't he listening to me? So um, what we did from this was uh, this is still a piloted project where we are working on individual scenes. But what I've done is pull out some of the screenshots from some of the scenes. So we've created a virtual reality software where you will step in the shoes of Malcolm, where in this first scene here, this is Malcolm. You can't see him with a little dot over his head, but he just missed the bus because he's trying to get to his appointment. He has a job, but his life is just very stressful. He's also married, so he misses the bus. And then he finally is able to uh, get to his appointment. And once he's able to get there, um, his doctor is rude to him and basically says in this particular scenario, I'm not going to get into your educational attainment or lack thereof. You should be able to get another job. Like So there are many times that the doctor won't understand about not being able to take off work. And so in this other example, uh, Malcolm, usually the drugs that they actually prescribe to Malcolm, it makes him sleepy and, and or lethargic on the job. So he's explaining the fatigue that he is actually getting from the um, drugs that they give him. Um, I would have played the whole scenario, but I know that my whole time here, I don't have a lot of time. So um, at the end of this, the medical students that we are working with at Howard University Hospital in the psychiatric department will fill out um, their experiences and what they actually got from this simulation of them actually seeing a day in the life of Malcolm. 
And so they'll fill out information, demographic information, of course, who they are, but then they'll also fill out um, related to what were their thoughts on the specific aspects about him? What kind of diagnosis do they want to give him? And then any overall thoughts about, you know, the overall appearance and um, usability of the particular virtual reality software. And so from this, we are working with Howard University Hospital. I think I mentioned that, but we do hope to at least expose 50 to 100 of the psychiatric medical students that just started this semester um, to be able to work with our uh, software. So the individuals that were key in creating um, this marriage between like the microaggressions and then also the virtual reality um, software is Dr. Daniel Hairston. She is director of psychiatry at Howard University. We also had a medical student who provided uh, um, experience with the voices and then also um, information about the different drugs. And then her also um, medical student, Ifosa, who also helped us and provided us information on like the different kind of things that a psychiatric patient would go through on a daily basis. And then on my team, I had Ben Corian, who's my graduate student, and then Ms. Kimberly Hill, who was uh, my postback researcher. And then finally, Ms. Mikhail Inguajo, who's my graduate student who worked on the microaggressions models to be able to individually identify what's gonna happen when a person talks into, or um, types into um, through free text um, at the end of the differential diagnosis plan. So what we are doing from there uh, is creating from both of those individual experiences, you said what kind of thought experiments. And so it's not really to punish individuals who, who say microaggressions, because I'm pretty sure that I say them or, you know, within my friend group or within my certain element. And so I also need to get better as well. So in doing this, it would be great to have these you said what thought experiments that would show an individual based over time, what they said, you know, on a quarterly basis. And so then that information could be relayed back to diversity, equity, and inclusion specialists and or individuals who work in those technical interviews to show them how they can get better and encourage students rather than discourage them from that process. And we are also adding more pop culture um, examples to our data set so that we're able to sort of get examples that cover memes and or, I don't know, TikTok or some of the, you know, um, hot topics that have been out there, um, especially since the pandemic has started. And so from there, we're updating our machine, learn machine learning models uh, to be able to run on the examples that are included in the data set. So from there, we're engaging in um, human conversational studies where uh, we'll have individuals talk for 15 to 20 minutes about like hot topics, which would really get people um, exposing their I guess microaggressions about different people. So a lot of people have um, thoughts about welfare in America or pro versus anti-abortion, which is a huge hot topic now. And um, the insurrection that happened in Washington, DC and then free speech, uh, Black Lives Matter, which some people love it, some people hate it. So, and that would be a very interesting topic. And then like bias and AI in general, um, DC is a very transient area where you have many, many different people from all over. So we hope to engage in at least these conversations this fall to be able to get more information and then show individuals the things that they said. You said what? And so from this work, I want to acknowledge the uh, individuals that uh, help support it. It's supported by many different things. Uh, Amazon, NSF, uh, we are also working with educational testing services as well through looking at some of the data that we have received from them to be able to identify microaggressions and tutoring conversations. And then um, 
Microsoft, Virginia Tech, we actually develop a partnership working on a joint paper with them. And they're actually looking at microaggressions in workforce conversations as well. So these are all the individuals that have contributed across the board to helping support this work and or the students in the lab. So I will end it there and you can definitely uh, shoot me more information. Um, we are signing people up, hopefully to be able to view our virtual reality software on my website. It will not be the 3D version, so it'll be just the version that runs in the website. But um, we'll be going into the actual classroom with Dr. Harrison and their students. So we hope to get a lot of different pictures and videos from that as well. So I will just open it up to questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Washington. That that was great, and I'm going to put a link to your lab here in the uh, the chat. There, I love Thanks. it. I mean, you're doing some really, and, and I echo Shai's comment. She said, uh, "Fantastic research, which is crucial to improving health equity." Thank you so much for you and your team's efforts. So, in thinking about health equity, what do you think are the top three uh, main issues that haven't been addressed yet, but are really crucial? to do so. Yeah, so um, truly um, working with black and brown patients and understanding their pain levels. So um, what we found is that a lot of the uh, doctors, especially sickle cell, so there's the Center for Sickle Cell Disease, who we're also trying to partner with to get some of their data. So it's been shown that, um, you know, they don't, well, people don't feel that Black people experience pain in the way that they do. And if you know anything about sickle cell disease, you can't really see it from, from the outside. So when you have doctors that don't understand the pain that's going on, um, and you only have the patient's word. So we would love to get some of that data to be able to identify uh, what is actually causing the disconnect between your diagnosis plan and, and leading to something better for a reducement of pain and or mental stress that comes along with psychiatry, sickle cell disease, and some of these other diseases that no one is listening to um, individuals as they come into the hospital. And then, um, of course, uh, with health disparities, just the amount of money that black and brown patients spend in the emergency room. So they would rather, and I say they, the patients even at Howard would rather go to the emergency room rather than have a primary care for physician. And sometimes it truly has to do with the angst and not wanting to discuss with your doctor and then them being able to microaggress you. And sometimes it's just easier just to go to the emergency room. And so we're spending trillions on emergency room. Wow, so much work that needs to be done. It, it just kind of, it amazes me how empathy and understanding really is informed by uh, one's own biases. Because I, I recently saw, uh, it was a presentation where they were talking about bruising. And you know sometimes those uh, illnesses that can't be seen but it's still there and people not believe that. It, it just kind of blows my mind. A lot of work to be done in that arena. Yeah, definitely. So for the students in the room who are interested in getting into data science, artificial intelligence, or, or, or this impactful work that you're doing, where would they start? Yeah, that is a very good question. So in my lab, I also invited some of my students, hopefully they came. So the first thing that I would do, if this is something that really interests you and you want to get in um, impact society, find a professor, reach out to them and just say, hey, can I help in any capacity? And then when you get that rapport with them, um, sometimes they'll let you work on projects that you come up with yourself. So at the beginning of my presentation, the project about microaggressions and technical interviews, that came from a student wanting to interview her fellow students about the microaggressions that they've experienced in their Silicon Valley internships. And she said that like from those interviews, like we had one tall black student and he, he was from Jamaica, but he said they would 
in Silicon Valley would say, oh, you're so tall and black. And I'm like, they actually said that to you? Like, who says that? But anyway, so he thought that he had to change himself to be able to fit there. And I had always saw him as so studious. I would have never have thought, you know, that him would be uh, subjected to microaggression. So definitely work with um professors who you want to reach out to and propose things that, um, you know, are interesting to you. And at the very least, even if they don't want to work with you, do it on your own. So there are projects now that you can easily, you know, create a Google website. If you're interested in studying something like a Google Sites, it's free. And then bring it to your um, professor and say, this is what I did. Is this interesting to you? And people love that sort of initiative. Professors do. Yeah, so true. Um, I know Stephanie put in the chat, they, she said that um, you people is a trigger in and all by itself. And I, even though I'm a grown up, depending on when I'm and how I'm talking, I'll get, you're so articulate. Yes. Like, I, I, I don't know what that means. Like, yeah. So, so how do you decipher this language where it could be in one instance, it could be, let's say empowering. And in another instance, it could be a microaggression. How do you determine the, the streams of language it, it, and its intent, right? Either for malintent or, or neutral or positive intent. Yeah. So there's, uh whole like psychologists are still struggling with this so from on one hand you will have individuals like Lillian Field who says oh this area doesn't exist like that there aren't microaggressions and it's because it's so subjective and individuals you rarely have an individual that will say yeah I actually said that to that person and I meant it kind of thing you know so that's why I think it's very important for this research. I'm trying to get through those thought experiments, individual examples that not only the speaker will actually say they said it, and then also the person to say how it made them feel and any information like heart rate, heart rate variability, and show them this is what mentally that did to that person. So it's so subjective, but um, we need, with data science, just to show them across the board and across different cultures that we're all saying it, we're all saying individual things that makes people uncomfortable. So how then in workforce environments where it really is about the productivity, do you limit those things? Yeah, very, very well said. And uh, somebody, Chris, put in the chat as if you thought it was going to be something different. It happened to me two days ago. So unfortunately, it does happen. And Zakia put, she, she asked, what more actionable actions will it take for the microaggressions, racist and sexist culture to, to end or at least a friendly amendment decrease? I'm not sure if it will ever end. What are your thoughts on that? Honestly, I I'm, I think I'm like you, cousin. <laughs> I do not think that microaggressions will end. And it truly is because like when we got into studying um, like the microaggressions, I wanted to show uh, from a data science point of view, like the graphs, even though the, the shows from 1980 had many of them and they were built into the storyline, they're still like the office lasted for what, 10 years, people are still watching it. And these things become funny. And so when you think about individuals who come from other countries and they learn these jokes, and they may say them because, hey, we laughed at the television show and, um, you know, you bring it into the workforce. So I do not think it ends truly. It, it's just it's going to be how we respond to them and then also how training can be put together in the workforce so that it can be fun. And then also individuals can see, well, OK, this really we were in a team meeting. So maybe that wasn't the best kind of time to make a joke about um, someone's hair because <laughs> that happens to me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. The hair thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because you said that your student got interested in it because of their experience of, in Silicon Valley. And I know some of our students have been, uh, let's say, apprehensive about entering Silicon Valley, even though it's a valley of opportunity yeah. uh, for, for many. 
And however, it can be very uh, thick as far as not being welcoming to different diverse groups of being having to conform a certain mold. And if you don't fit that mold, you're kind of in the out. So has there been some sort of impact or outreach and engagement with Silicon Valley folks about language and your work? And how was it received? So um, I do know that definitely Silicon Valley is trying to get better to provide different sort of trainings for their um technical interviews specifically, which uh, across the board from um, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, they have, you know, brought HBCU faculty there to actually engage with them. So the faculty and residence training, we were there from like the whole summer and they learned from us. We had panels on like the culture of HBCUs that they were not familiar with so that they can understand it. So I know that they're thinking of um, wanting to get better and wanting to increase the diversity in their hires. But I will say um, it still persists because there are individuals who do believe like, oh, well, you didn't go to a Carnegie Mellon or you didn't go to an MIT. So that not only confounds with your race, it, it, you know, it just builds on top of it. And then if you're um, a woman and uh, this is not talked about in Silicon Valley a lot too, but the caste system, there's been several articles on how um, persons from Indian um, and on Middle Eastern are also subjected based on the caste system. And even when they come here into America, they're still subjected to that. So there's still trying to get better, but I think there's a lot of work that has to be done. Um, with the pandemic, they did say virtual interviews are a little bit better, but most times they make you turn on your camera. And so I think a really good thought experiment would be to have virtual reality software a person can adopt. Let's say they pretend to be a, you know, a woman girl coder and they're doing great. Like, would that, what would that person say to the interviewer at that moment? So yeah. 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 There's, there's still a lot of work to be done and there's still a lot of opportunities. And yeah, it, yeah, I, I appreciate the uh, ambassadorship that HBC faculties have done to Silicon Valley. And one of your uh, former colleagues, Dr. Kenneth Gorshay was involved with that as well. He's mm -hmm. at Morehouse College. So yeah, that's great. We were there together. Yeah. 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 He, he's great. He's, he's been with us and hung out with us. And somebody just put in the chat, it said, I have had interviews ask me, what did you even learn in that class? Because it didn't make much sense for a math class they took at HU. Uh, yeah, that, that, that does happen. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. And I will say for myself, like, so we did the technical interview. So they, they said, hey, we want you to experience what your students are experiencing. But what happens is when they come in the room, they're like, oh, should I call you doctor? And I'm like, no, it's Gloria. I just want to be a regular, you know, so that kind of threw me off. And then it was like, oh, well, you teach CS1, don't you? Or you teach CS2, don't you? And I was like, I do, but it's different. So I, I everything just left my my head and I actually forgot how to do a link list and I'm like this is something that I I say to my students all the time so I can imagine how stressed they are in just starting out as like an 18 and or 19 year old mm -hmm. intern for the first time so it's a lot so yeah. what tips do you have for somebody starting that internship uh, trajectory or wanting to Go into a different internship trajectory. Do you have any words of wisdom? Yeah. So that basically when my student was interviewing people, she also got these high level tips as well. So first thing is um, like if you experience some sort of microaggression during the technical interview, uh, the easiest thing is to pose it back to them. Well, why do you say that? Like, um, well, what did they teach at your HBCU? So have them expound on it. And usually people do not want to expound on something microaggressive that they said. They'll be like, oh, well, let's change the subject and just answer another question. And then um, don't forget who you are. 
like imposter syndrome and all the emotions that are going on with students and even myself, I felt like an undergraduate. I was like, I can't remember a link list and I'm writing on the board. So I was questioning everything that I learned. So don't forget who you are. You know this. This is one interview and it doesn't make or break you. And they need you to impact their environment because at the very least, they don't have a lot of black and brown students that are going there. So just your experience being in that environment will help them. So you got to remember who you are and that you don't beat yourself up if it goes good. If it goes bad, it's just truly an experience for you to learn from and hopefully to teach them if you turn it back on them. Well, why do you say that? All right. All right. Wow. That's that's so true. I, I like that. And what, what did you mean by that? Can you give me a little bit more information so I can answer that question better for you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Throwing shade back, right? Yeah. That, that's good uh, words of wisdom there. And you said that um, students, they take action in creating projects. So how do students go about doing that, in particular for students who may have not started up a project with the faculty member? What could that look like? Yeah, so um, in the case of the student that wanted to study her peers that went to Silicon Valley, she had a horrible experience where she interviewed 10 times with one company. This was in her senior year, and they still didn't end up hiring her. So she that's why it was passion, like she had so much passion to understand, like, what is going on here? And so with that, she created a website, sign, had people sign up times that they can come talk with her. Then she took notes on all the individuals and then reported it in like a presentation, either for a senior project and then also for like a software engineering. So if you see something that uh, could be an idea, you could turn into a project for one of your classes so that you get the bang for the buck of like, oh, I actually was passionate working on it and presenting it and coding it up. So even though it was just a website, she could have also put in a plugin that um, looked at the facial expressions, which that's what some people did in different classes. So it's really... Um, cool how you can take an idea and make it work for yourself. Don't feel like you have to have someone mentoring you through the process because sometimes it's always good to come with your own idea. And then also another thing, when those uh, tech companies visit HBCUs, because they're always at HBCUs, right? Trying to get you. What you should say is like, well, are you working on these kind of projects? I would love to work on that. Like start the conversation, uh, say more about you so that you can get what you need from them because definitely believe they're going to get what they need from you. They're going to take pictures of you while you're there and you're going to be included in pamphlets. At least I remember with the faculty and residents, we were invited to a beach party and I was like, oh, this is so cool that like this company is doing this. And they were recording. We found out that they were recording. They made pamphlets. They put it on the websites. This is our culture for the African-American and black and brown. We're like, wait, that wasn't just because you wanted to give us free food and a beach party. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but those are the, yeah again, good, good words of wisdom. And thanks, Nicole. Tell, she put a link in the chat about um, technical interview practice with um, Brilliant Black Minds. That's a great uh, resource there. And then Stephanie says, I got the microaggression when inquiries are made about me being a student because of my salt and pepper colored hair. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, people make assumptions. And yeah. then somebody, somebody asked, any thoughts about using these analysis and verbal police interactions with different segments of the population? Great question. That is a great question. Um, I would love that. Um, from my understanding, there are data sets of like what was happening during the pandemic of the videos and um, all the videos are there, all the audio is there. It just has to be converted to text for looking at analysis. But that's something I definitely wanna work on. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a, an open question, something, something to explore. Yes. Uh, and then somebody put um, some tips in the chat. You chat. You are not your code. Learn something new daily and fail fast. 
Oh, and then like if you take the initiative for like a side project, always say that in the interview too, because they love that. They're like, oh, this was a thing that you created. Uh, definitely here's my GitHub, here's my website to take a look at that project that I created. They love initiative. Oh yes, definitely. And so your work, it really intersects with different disciplines. You mentioned linguistics, and then you have the health sciences. And so people in health or medicine, and I can imagine other fields as well. So who, who do you collaborate with? And can you tell us more about the, I'm assuming here, that there's a team um, spirit somewhere in, in your work and how you do your work. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yes. So um, when we first started out, I did not know much about like microaggressions. I knew that people said them to me and I was just like, oh, this is like something I guess I'm going to have to get used to forever. But there's a, a whole body of work. Uh, so we started working with uh, Dr. Jashan Mans, who is in psychology. She not only trained my students on the different kinds, I didn't even recognize the different kinds, racial, gender, intersectionality like there's so many different kinds and you know black people to black people say them to each other too racial social economic your colorism all of that i was like oh my god like so uh we definitely interact with she has a whole group of master students as well that have studied microaggressions um across um um, healthcare and as it relates to black women. So black women uh, experience hypertension and heart disease because we're the most microaggressed and it wears on your heart. And I didn't, I didn't realize that either. I was like, wow. So um, then we also have individuals in linguistics. Uh, we met a team of researchers from Virginia Tech that are looking at workplace. So they're more human resources and business who actually want to get into helping microaggressions from the business perspective of like return on investment for companies if they tackle these hard problems in the workforce and like those teaming environments. So um I know with computer science, uh, we think we can kind of handle it all and we don't need outside, you know, help. But uh, I've definitely leaned on psychologists, um, sociologists, and then also um, just individuals who can just give us some information about ethnographic studies, like how what kind of ask for different people. Uh, what is the culture versus um, Southern versus Northern versus like the West Coast? Um, it, it's just so much to learn. So definitely we're interdisciplinary and I know that I couldn't do it uh, alone. So I would love to even have a bigger sort of effort that is some sort of convergent workshop where psychologists, people from the tech field come and we just all engage in these thought conversations to help us get better. That's wonderful. Yeah, because here we we like to have different disciplines come together and, and, and look at data science. And that's one of the, the joys of data science that really cuts across uh, multiple fields. There's a group of uh, fantastic faculty at Clark Atlanta from the School of Social Work that are that led a summer data social work core. And we also did a workshop in the intersection of data science and prosecutorial performance. So it was a bunch of uh, data geeks and, and criminal justice folks in there thinking about how do we use data science to look at uh, the performance of prosecutors' offices and be helpful to them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that's one thing I really like about it, that it's not just the, the data science. Obviously, there, you can go deep on the technical, but there's a lot of neat applications in different arenas. Yeah, definitely. And at least for me, I didn't I did not recognize the amount of money that companies are spending on DNI. 16 trillion. Like, can you imagine if like a little bit of that is peeled off in some sort of fashion where it makes a difference in a spe you know, a specific HBCU community? So if we're working on this, hey, give us a piece of the 16 trillion. <laughs> so <laughs> It's good to have collaborative. I, I know we've enjoyed our relationships with our industry partners to kind of think through how should we do things here. And then also in the conversations, they're thinking on their end, well, how should we do things uh, from yeah. our end? And how do we just better engage and work together? So it, it, it is good to have it that 
ecosystem all together with students, with industry, with faculty, and, and performing those networks because it, it takes everybody. Right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So I really appreciate you spending time with us and your, I think your work, your research is really um, interesting. It just hits different topic areas and, and really impactful. And it really shows neat ways on, on how you can use data science as a tool to uncover, uncover what's happening in, in communication, which is vital in, in multiple ways that you know can't, can't be understanding from like somebody said in the chat, um, policing, interacting with different segments of the population to health, to the interview, to the workplace, to, to everywhere, to walking down the street or sitting at a hotel and somebody thinking you're the health, right? So uh, it's, yeah, I'm there. So it, it, it is important and we're really thankful for your work and, and look forward to hearing more about um, maybe the impacts and how can it inform how we can just communicate better. Because I, I come from the an optimistic view that people want to communicate well, yeah. but sometimes we get, you know, maybe some all in the family verbiage that's kind of embedded in our head somewhere. <laughs> I think like I play back in my head certain scenarios and start to laugh at them. It's like, gosh, that kind of mirrors the office. And if it's in my head, I know it's in yours and everyone else's. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of work in uh, data science. And so I really appreciate everybody coming and hanging out with the, uh, should I say double Dr. Washington's? <laughs> right. Yeah. 